So where has that left you with the church? Um, so I, I stopped attending um, in July. I uh, stopped attending. Of 2018? Yeah, of this okay. year. I, uh, I, I went to my bishop and I just, I just said, look, I said, um, I love the church. I do. Uh, you know, he knows. I mean, I have some serious concerns and issues with it right now. But I said, uh, ultimately, I need to be with my family on Sundays. And so I'd like to be released from my calling. And so I, I, and I don't attend now. I, I, uh, and I don't know that, um, yeah, I, I can't see myself ever attending again. Um, despite my love for it and just, I just, I just can't see that happening because of my convictions. What, so that means a loss of, I'm, I'm assuming you're not, kind of stopping going to church, but still believing it's all true. So where have you settled on kind of the basic truth claims of the church? If you're, to whatever extent you're willing to talk about that. Oh, sure. Or, no, or, I, I mean, so I, so let's start with God, like go through, kind of go down the, um, you know, I'm, cause there's, okay, let me tell you why I'm asking. Sure. There's a lot of people that lose their faith and then they don't know, what do I believe? Do I believe anything? Do I still believe in God? Do I still believe in Jesus? Sure. Do I still value the scriptures? Do I still hold them as sacred? Do I hold them as symbolic? Do I throw them away as garbage and Iron Age mumbo jumbo? Do I go fully secular? So yeah. what I, I imagine that you're, you've been so thoughtful about these issues, your paradigm shift yet again mm -hmm. might be useful to people. So that's why I'm asking you sure. to kind of let people know how someone as thoughtful as you has settled on these prime questions. Okay. Starting sure. with God. Okay, with God. Um, I, uh, oh man, it's, I'm an agnostic believer. I'm so an agnostic theist. Yeah. And you can, people don't understand I know. that there's a difference between agnosticism or whatever the opposite is yeah. and atheism versus theism. They're on different spectrums. Explain that. So in other words, I, uh, I don't claim to know or that there is a, a, a God, um, of course, but I, but I choose to believe, um, because I, I like the idea and notion of it and it, it works for me. It makes sense to me, but I, at the same time, I'm like, um, the idea of an interventionist God of who's intervening in daily affairs. That's something I have a really hard time having a belief in. Like a personal anthropomorphic yeah, I have a God. Really, that's I, I have a really hard time helping you find your keys. Yeah. And Curing you of cancer. Yeah, I have, a, I have a very hard time believing that that is Why? a reality. Um, Just the suffering, all the suffering in the world? Sure. That's a big part of it. Um, that's a big part of it. And not, not to mention, it even started when I was a lot more, I guess, traditionally minded in my beliefs. And that is that I kind of felt like, you know, the thing that made sense to me is agency. And if we're going to hear and grow and develop, that you kind of, God would have to step back and, and allow us to kind of go through that. So even in my much more traditional beliefs, I, I still, the idea of an interventionist God didn't make a whole lot of sense to me theologically even then. So, um, I guess, I guess that's where I am with God. Um, but so you don't know, but you still choose to believe. Yeah, so but, but it's not a, but it's not a big driver either. Um, for me theologically and, and religiously, um, as strange as that may sound. But the reason for that is that I believe that human beings, we should strive to eradicate poverty, that we should strive to eradicate war, that we should create heaven on earth, which is what Jesus was about. And to me, that's the focus. That's what it should be for us to receive true enlightenment rather than worrying about, is there a God who's going to intervene or am I going to go to the heaven or something like that? Because the truth is, is, and I've always said it this way, is if, um, if that's your focus, then you're okay either way, right? If death is the end, then it, it doesn't matter. You've taken full advantage of this incredible gift to, of life to make the world a better place and to live a wonderful, happy, productive life. And if, if there's not, a, and, a, and if there is a God, I fully believe that that individual would be capable of so much love and justice and compassion that if that's what you focused on, you're gonna be fine. So it, so it, it really doesn't matter to me in a sense. So what is God to you? God is love. 
Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but is it an energy? Is it science? Is it a know. force? I don't know. Okay, so and, I, and I that's really okay. Don't. Yeah, that, that's, I, I really don't know. That, I'm not. That's yeah, actually no, I, can be strong and beautiful and powerful. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So for you, God has you don't have any form to God. Yeah. I mean, I, of course I've raised LDS. So in the back of my mind, God is anthropomorphic and human. And I, I, you know, I, I, but I just don't, I don't focus a lot on that anymore. It's just not. But you say you're a believer. I guess. That's fine. Okay. But it's just very loose. It's very, it's very, it's very loose. And nondescript. It's it's very loose. It's just a feeling. Is it a feeling? Sure. Okay. Sure. Sounds like you haven't put a lot of intellectual form to your sense of God. You know, I haven't, I, it's it, because that's not, it's not any longer the, the, the primary driver in my religion. Got it. Okay. And then, so the historical Jesus and the resurrected Jesus and the atonement, uh-huh. I, I, what is that? What role Okay. That I love Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely love Jesus. I love teaching his, I taught historical Jesus courses at, at Utah State University. Um, I certainly consider myself a Christian. Um, to what ex- it becomes so nuanced. It's hard to talk about in, in just an, in an interview such as this. I'm not trying to be evasive, but it, it just really is. For example, is Jesus the son of God? Well, what does that mean to be the son of God? It depends upon which New Testament source you're talking about. Early Christians believed that Jesus was the son of God. And we can see this because of the epistles um, that predate the gospel sources. And there are, there are portions, there are poetic phrases in there that clearly stem from hymns and rituals that early Christians participated in prior to even the creation of the epistles. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And if you look at those carefully, you can see the earliest Christ- Christology that early disciples of Jesus embraced. And that early Christology was that Jesus became the Son of God when he was resurrected. That's when he became the Son of God. Then... If we take that view, which is the earliest one we can document historically, compare that with what we see in Mark, which is the earliest New Testament gospel. Mark was written about 68 CE or so. And in Mark, when does Jesus, when is he identified as the son of God? At the baptism. Note that that Mark doesn't preserve anything about Mary and virgin birth or anything like that. And if Mark had been familiar with those traditions, we'd have to assume that he would have included them. Right? I mean, you wouldn't leave that out. It's kind of a big deal if Jesus was born of a virgin. But no, Mark puts Jesus' son of Godship at the baptism and the start of his ministry. God speaks from heaven. This is my beloved son. This day I have begotten you. So you have a movement of Jesus' divine sonship to the start of his ministry. Then you get to the next gospels that are written historically. You get to Matthew and Luke. And they are the ones that say, no, 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 Jesus was born to a virgin as the son of God. So Jesus' divine sonship actually goes back to his birth. You can see the way this is evolving. And then the last New Testament gospel to be written is John. Before the world was. <laughs> you got <laughs> In it. In the beginning. You got it. Exactly, exactly right. So the, you see the, tail these, get, the fish gets bigger. Exactly. So yeah. you see these things evolve over time, and they're just clearly there. We can't deny them. It's just a reality yeah. of how Christology developed. And, and you can make sense of it as a traditional believer. Sure, you have to shift some paradigms, but you can make sense of it. But that's what I say Like when you ask me, is like, Jesus, the Son of God, I the scholar comes out to me and says, in what sense, right? Uh, sure. You know, I, and, 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 and what does that mean to be the son of God? I, you know, it, in early Judaism at the time period, we can see that what that meant to them is not what it means to us today. You see that, for example, with Psalm 2, where, in, where God speaks to the um, Israelite king and says, today you are my son, you have begotten you. So to be the son of God meant to be a, a king, a king over Israel. And that seems to be the way that early Christians interpreted that that uh, that definition and so is Jesus the Son of God? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, in what sense? I mean, and things like that. So, how important is a physical resurrection and Him atoning for your sins so that you can be washed clean to return to God? How important is all that? I love it as a beautiful theological construct. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, um, but to what extent is, does that reflect literal reality? Um, it, yeah, that's not a big driver for me anymore. Okay. What about, uh, so your, your being a Christian is more about following his teachings of love and service and that sure, sort of Sure, and a choice of belief that he, um, 
And I mean, I still self-identify as Mormon too. I will always be Mormon. Um, but I, uh, I, just, I have a harder time. I de- I have an easier time identifying as a Mormon than I do a Christian. Interesting. Cause I, for some reason I'm a cultural Mormon. What else am I? Right? Yeah. Yeah. But Christianity for me denotes an exclusive truth claim, a path, and I guess Mormonism does too, but for some reason, yeah. I, I have a harder time identifying as a Christian now than I do a Mormon, just because I don't want to offend Buddhists or Muslims or Jews. I, yeah. You know? Uh, how, yeah, no, how have I, you gotten over that? No, I, 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 I mean, I teach world religion, and I teach, um, I taught you know, semesters of introduction to Judaism at, at Utah State. The truth is, I have a deep love and reverence for all world traditions, including secular humanism. You mentioned Greg Epstein, Good Without God. I... I, I, I believe we can't escape religion is the reality of it. We just can't. It's, it's hardwired into our DNA as human beings. The, the cognitive revolution um, created not only a brain that could think and reason and speak, but an ability to create social constructs, fictions even. And those allowed Homo sapiens to work together and to create civilization, to create communities and based upon common beliefs in things that are not attested in the biological reality world that we experience. The U.S. Constitution is certainly that way. I mean, the idea that all men are created equal. Well, if you're just talking biology, that's not true. That's a fiction. It's a myth. Um, But it's a beautiful myth that ties people together. And when we start to believe in it, we're able to accomplish extraordinary things as a species. And I see religion that way. I see Mormonism that way. It's why I still love the church, notwithstanding my issues. It's why I self-identify as Mormon. It's why I love Buddhism. I love Hinduism. I love Islam. And I love teaching students about these different faith traditions that people have used to construct their lives and their societies that are an integral part of the human experience. So you can call yourself a Christian just because religion's inescapable and that's kind of what you are. Yeah, you know, it's funny. But you don't mean it in the... Christianity yeah. is the one true path sense. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. I, I would never, I don't believe in one true path. Um, I, I didn't, I haven't believed in that for a long time. But I, uh, I actually was sitting, I was talking to my wife, I was like, you know, I wonder if I should convert to Judaism. You know, just because, <laughs> I mean, I just have, I have this background and I just love Judaism. I'm so passionate about it. And then I thought... Yeah, but then I'd have to give up barbecue, and I don't know that I could give up barbecuing <laughs> pork. pork. And uh, you know, I'm just like, yeah, it's just I'm just going to be an outside admirer of all these things. So. Okay. When you uh, we're going to talk about in the in the next segment, we're going to talk about this book, authoring the Old Testament, and uh, this was published just three years ago, right? Mm-hmm. In this book, you are really working hard to to help readers know that they can understand all these principles of higher criticism and and the document to hypothesis and all Mm -hmm. that and maintain their faith. Yeah. Um, So you come across in this book very much as still a a literal believer in the restoration and in Mormonism and in Mormon scripture. Uh, Did that change at some point Um, between writing the book and now? I still believe everything that's in the book in the sense that I think it's a wonderful way of... Okay, well, let's do that. Make, tell me about the restoration. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the restoration? Start with Joseph Smith. Um, I love Joseph Smith. I consider him a, a prophet. Um, in the sense of what word? And, and, <laughs> See, but that's what that's, we have to talk no, about. No, no, terms. I know. You're, just a quick version. Um, prophet means what? Uh, someone who leads no. out and... <clears throat> bucks up against society and helps people to create a spiritual community. That's great. Yeah. So not God's official mouthpiece on the earth exclusively. We, it, it's so interesting. I mean, to me, if we really even look at some of these scriptural texts like uh, that he produces, like Doctrine and Covenants section one, right? That very famous section where, you know, it, it, here's this passage that I think we, we take, phrases out of context so frequently because you have a passage in dnc for one that is so famous where by my own mouth or by the mouth of my servants it is the same and we say therefore when the prophet speaks it's the same thing as when god speaks but we don't read the rest of it that's around there and it's then the lord says i lord have spoken these things 
all my word will be fulfilled, whether it is spoken by my own voice or by the mouth of my servants, my word will all be fulfilled. But we take that excerpt to bulk up prophetic authority in our church and, and take it out of context for what it, what it means. Yeah, the idea of prophetic infallibility or, you know, someone who can absolutely directly speak for God in, in, as a mouthpiece um, in every sense of the word. I mean, that's, that's, that's just not consistent with church history. Either, so the idea that text. God has one prophet who has all the keys and authority to lead mankind in righteousness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what we think of Russell Nelson, Thomas S. Monson, Gordon Lee Hinckley, Ezra Jeff Benson, you know, all the way back to Joseph Smith. That idea of God's one prophet on the earth, you're saying what? I'm saying... I don't know what I'm saying. I'm saying I... And I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm trying to... I'm, I'm trying to say that I don't believe that there is one way for humans to build heaven on earth and to please divinity, whatever that might be or however it form, which I don't understand. Um, yeah. And so other examples of prophets would be who for you? Oh, uh, a more flexible version of prophet a, a would prophet. include, um, who, who are your favorite prophets by the Bob Dylan? Okay. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. You're not joking. No. Why? Um, because here's a man who raises great social criticism and who uses poetry, which we often see happening in the Hebrew Bible, um, who is able to elevate humans to a higher spiritual plane. That's a prophet in a sense. Who else? I see, I see, you know, prophets as critics who, because in the old Testament, at least prophets aren't what they are in, in our Latter-day Saint tradition where you have a central authority who is oh, runs the cult. And I use that not in a pejorative sense, but you know, the religion, religious organization or entity, you don't see that. And in. instead these are outsiders Isaiah, uh, yeah, who come in and criticize, who offer social political criticism, who um, criticize the religious leaders and what they're doing. And that's what prophets are doing. Anciently prophets were, I mean that to, today it was a paid profession as well. And, Today, those roles are being fulfilled in our society by journalists, by songwriters, by poets, the traditional role of a prophet. So yeah, I am deadly serious that those traditional roles that we see in the Hebrew Bible of prophets are being fulfilled in our society um, by those sorts of individuals. Now, now I'm not saying that... um, President Nelson isn't a prophet. I believe he's a a prophet for the LDS Church. Right, right, right. Okay, so what do you so Joseph Smith qualifies as a prophet? Sure. What do you do with uh, the Mormon canon? He, the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, yeah, Doctrine and Covenants. So I, I think the Book of Mormon is one of the most inspired books ever written. I think it has a inspired apocalyptic message that is essential for Americans specifically to embrace. Um, and that is when the Book of Mormon is read critically and carefully and against the grain, some really important themes start to emerge. We start to realize that it, we have racist views in the Book of Mormon by its authors uh, who view themselves as superior to the Lamanites in every sense of the term. And yet that racism causes division and strife and problems and ultimately leads to the demise of the entire civilization. There's a message for Americans, especially was in the 19th century. Of you know, it's very important. But that's today, and and Trump's America. Not pro racism. It's you're saying you can view the Book of Mormon as a, an example of racism that we need to avoid. Is that what you're yes, saying? Yes, to avoid the type of racism that plagued the Nephite authors, and it absolutely. And then ultimately, this idea of creating a society like Jesus helps to create, where we are eliminate isms and, and people start to work together and, and to eradicate poverty and create heaven on earth. I mean, literally that's what the Nephite civilization does. So it's a blueprint in many ways to accomplish those things. Yeah, I know I, I love the book of Mormon. There is a deep power in that text that, uh, do you still I read it we, oh, yeah. for personal spiritual growth? 
Um, yeah, once in a while. I, I'm, I'm pretty busy these days with my, <laughs> with, um, with other things, but I, uh, no, I just, yeah, no, I, I love it I, deeply. Natalie writes, wow, I had never thought of the Book of Mormon like that. That is beautiful. So you want at least one convert in Natalie. I, I, it was funny. I, I said, with John's audience, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to piss everybody off. No, no, no. <laughs> so I'm glad I don't think that so. I didn't that's not what I'm getting. Because we have that's a good, good group. We have a good group uh, who are still hanging on. Trent writes, what about the racist God um, marking and separating people? So he's basically saying the God of, of the Book of Mormon is racist. Yeah. So here's the thing is that I don't see scripture that way because of my training. Yeah. So for example, the Old Testament, rather than a manual, like, you know, that would help somebody set up a stereo system or something like that, a manual that defines who God is, the Old Testament is, should be a springboard for people to receive their own enlightenment. It's reality, a depiction of how those ancient people saw God in light of their culture, their environment that they lived in. And that we can then use that to kind of say, oh, well, you know, they depict God this way. I don't agree with that. But even a negative portrayal in that sense helps you point you towards how, what your own convictions are. So it's a springboard. And I see the Book of Mormon as that just because they, yeah, because some Nephite voices present God as racist doesn't mean I think they're right. I know they're wrong, but I learn from them. And what did that view of God do to them and their society? It's... It's a profound message. So if you were to summarize what scripture is to you, scripture is? Springboard to for enlightenment. For enlightenment yeah. of what? Towards how to live a happy, productive, spiritual existence. Hmm. Not God's commandments to us. Uh, I mean, the scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants, full of commandments. Don't drink this, drink that. Don't eat yeah. this, eat that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's also doctrine. It's like, this is and what heaven's and like. Then, this and is I, what... I, okay, so, yeah, and then you just, you look at that and say, where's the cultural, you know, drive that caused these people to feel that this was a command from God? To what extent does it reflect my experience with divinity, my experience with spirituality, and therefore I'll apply it and, and, and use it or reject it, as the case might be. To me, and, that's how everything should be used, including Joseph Smith. I mean, the, the mere, I don't think, for example, his problems with polygamy should be swept under apologetically under the proverbial rug. I think we should, as a community, identify those, embrace those things and say, look, there's an abuse of power, of ecclesiastical power here. We need to protect ourselves, our young people from this. And it can happen to anybody. It happened to Joseph Smith. I would say that's how, that's how I use this, this material. And, and when I talk about it, it's being inspired it's from that sense. So what do you say about the approach that, that says, okay, what does DNC 76 say about the three degrees of glory? That's what heaven's like. Okay, what is, you know, what does it say about women in the church? Oh, that's what the Bible says. What, is it, what does it say about authority and deacons and whatever? People are looking to it for, and commandments, right? Don't have premarital sex or yeah. sex is next to murder or whatever it is, right? Premarital sex. People are looking to it for, how God wants them to live, yep. what the church should be set up to do, and kind of what what is the reality of the universe and our existence, mm -hmm. meaning an afterlife and an atonement and a resurrection. Most Mormons and probably most Orthodox religious people are using it in those senses. Yeah. Do you think that they're being misled? Are they being fooled? Are they misguided? Is that... Unfortunately, everybody has, everybody has their own path, right? And I, you know, I would not say that they're misguided or misled. And if it is helping them to live happy, moral lives, then it, then I, I fully support that. Um, so no, not misled or misguided. But um, I would say that for me, that doesn't work and is problematic because um, if we just stick to the Bible, for example, there is not a consistent portrayal on any point of significance found in the Hebrew Bible. It is not a book. The Hebrew Bible is a library from ancient Israel. And there are contradictions that are intentional. I like to point students, um, for example, you know, the horrific ban that God orders in Joshua and several other places in the Hebrew Bible it commands the Israelites to eradicate every man, woman, and child and kill the beast uh, of the community as well, slaughter everything. It's horrific, it's terrible. 
And um, certainly not my view of, you know, of what would be inspired. Um, but then there's the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah, in many ways, reacts to that view and says, no, 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 God isn't that way. God is gracious. He is loving even to Israel's enemies, even to the sparing of the cattle of the city. And that's what happens then in the book of Jonah. So you have a totally different view of God. So if you're going to take, from my perspective, a manual approach to the Bible and say, okay, the Bible says this about God, therefore that is true. Or the Bible says we should do this, therefore that is true. You're going to run into problems because the Bible doesn't is a, a library of material written, at least the Hebrew Bible, written over a thousand year time period with very different theological views. Even God is not portrayed the same way anthropomorphically or whatever. So to use it that way runs a person will quickly run into problems, and so it wouldn't it would, that would never work for me. But if it does for others and helps them, I I'm not going to critique that. Okay. Um, what what do you do with so the Book of Mormon, uh, Book of Abraham? The, there's a couple things progressive and post Mormons do. They're like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, Joseph Smith was sleeping with other men's wives with young teenage girls, like he's a fraud, mm -hmm. therefore throw out the Book of Mormon, throw out the Book of Abraham, throw out the DNC. It's all garbage because it was built by a man that was a fraud and a charlatan. How do you, what do you say about someone having that approach, about I, someone having that reaction? I say if, if then those beliefs in, uh, are causing pain, are causing frustration and turmoil, they should be jettisoned, absolutely. Um, and then the person should try to seek other forms of enlightenment and joy and what will bring you know, happiness to them. I have, I, have, I, have no, I have no problem with people jettisoning that. I, the reality is, is the fact of the matter is, is that the church doesn't work for everyone. It just doesn't. I mean, you have to fit it. It does really well if you, you fit a specific mold. But if you are a single man, if you're a divorced woman, if you are, you know, an LGBT person or family, or if you even just kind of think out of the box a little socially or politically, the church can be a very painful institution to be a part of. And therefore, you know, people, I, I, I think believing committed Latter-day Saints need to recognize that so that they can minister and help people more effectively. Um, so I, I have no issue if, with people doing that as long as they are able then to um, replace that with something that's going to provide them with peace and joy and comfort. I have no issue with that, but I, uh, but sounds like you haven't thrown those scriptures totally out. No, no. W what's allowed you to keep them, even though I'm guessing you don't believe Joseph Smith was God's one true prophet with authority on the earth now. Yeah. So I guess well, part of it is just, it, it, admittedly, it's just the way I was raised. I mean, I cannot, I can't, I, Mormonism frames the way I see God. We talked about that a minute ago, even though I'm somewhat agnostic on details. It, it's framed the way I see. I, I just, um, you know, I, I drove by the other day and I saw a group of young men and young women in, from a local LDS ward out taking care of um, an elderly couple's yard, all as a huge service project. And I was filled with so much joy and happiness and gratitude for the church and what it does and how it helps people. I, yeah, so it, it, what it comes down to is, no, I'm not willing to throw it out because I love the church. I love my community. These are my people. I want to do everything I can to help them. I, I'm not, I, I, my help was from 18 years was with the, it was an effort to help the institution. I can no longer do that, not in good conscience, but I still very much want to be a part of the community and, and help individuals to the extent that I can. I and, that, and that keeps you from throwing out the scripture for you? Um, part, that's part of it. Yeah. But it also is just a sheer love of it. I mean, I just, I love the Book of Mormon. I love it. I, I think it's a beautiful text. I mean, even like when I taught it as literature up at the University of Utah, it's an extraordinary document that draws upon ancient themes and motifs and puts that into a context of 19th century American Christianity and 
presents a message that I think is very important, especially for America today. I mean, reality, to me, the Book of Mormon, if we read it correctly, is a rejection of Trump's America. Hmm. I really do. That'll so. make some of my listeners angry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm some okay don't with like that. Trump, some do. That's okay. <laughs> um, how, how do you view the Book of Mormon as coming to be? Do you have a brief kind of, you, you've understood the creation of documents, of texts, did did it did it was it delivered by an angel with golden plates and Joseph translated? If not, there are all these arguments by general authorities that a, a local farm boy, uneducated, could never have created that book in twelve days or whatever they claim. Have you tried to put together your theory for how the book came to be? Oh sure. Um, I mean, as a historian, the thing to to, to recognize is historians cannot rely upon miracles to uh, to define events from the past. And the reason we cannot do that is because, by definition, a miracle is the least likely thing to have occurred. That's why we call it a miracle. Historians have to rely upon evidence. And what we're trying to do is to recreate what is the most likely thing based upon the evidence that transpired in the past. And you can't use miracles. If Joseph Smith had, if an angel came to Joseph Smith and delivered golden plates and he translated those by the power of God, that's a miracle. I'm not saying that didn't happen, but I am saying that if it did, that's not something a historian can, can address. We don't have the tools to do so. So as a historian, it's very easy for me to, to use the historical evidence and to see Joseph Smith as the creator of the Book of Mormon. How do you do it in 80 days or whatever they claim? Well, the, the first thing is, is that um, Joseph Smith, of course, had a very active imagination. I mean, we know that from his mother and others. He was great at telling stories. He would sit around the fireplace and tell his family stories about the indigenous people, what they would wear, the types of things they would drive carts in, and they would sit around and entertain for hours. Besides that, Joseph Smith is a From the early 1820s, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Besides yeah. that, Joseph Smith is a brilliant man, and he's very well read in the Bible. This is a time in, when, in American history where hey, he didn't have movies, he didn't have... <laughs> You know, internet, obviously. Netflix binging. No, he's not going to do that. So what is he doing for entertainment? He's reading the Bible. Yeah. This man knew the Bible backwards and forward, and you see that come through in the Book of Mormon. Not only in the type scenes and the, the poetry that appears, but in the very words and phrases that are adopted and taken right out of that. And then and then it's easy, of course, to explain from an historical perspective that... that um, you know, there are Indian origin myths that are going along that connect them with Israelite origins, and you start to put the pieces together. As a historian, it's very easy to explain as a natural phenomenon the Book of Mormon without any divine inter interference at all. Everybody wants to say it's such a miraculous book, no, Joseph Smith could have never created it. Okay, that's just not true from a historical perspective. So how, so, so how could it have happened? Just the way I explained I mean, he just, he, the first of all, the origin stories of the myths of Indians and native people um, connected with Israelites. You have like the, you know, treasure seeking activities that he's involved with, with guardian spirits and angels, which helped could formulate the um, origin of how he obtains the plates. Everything there fits so perfectly into historical context. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying that that is truth, that Joseph Smith did not translate the Book of Mormon by the power of God and that angels did not appear. I'm saying that as a historian, that's the only way we can explain it by using the tools of scholarship. And we can easily do that. If a person chooses to believe in the Book of Mormon, um, and that's one of my other issues, John, with apologetics, is that we're using the wrong tools to assess these things. If a, if a person, because the scholarship leads us to put the Book of Mormon clearly in the 19th century. But if a person chooses to believe in it as and the story and the narratives around it, that's a, that's a step of faith. That's a leap of faith, and I'm fine with that. I think I think humans need to take that for that and in, in other scriptures, and I'm, I'm I'm cool with that. But so I'm not saying the Book of Mormon is not an ancient text. I'm saying as a historian, it's easy to explain its origins in the way that I've hinted at right now. What about all this about he? He didn't, you know, he was transcribing it and he couldn't have transcribed it in the, in the days or weeks or months that the time frame that they've said that there's no way he could have produced it in and that short time frame. People do extraordinary things all the time. And uh, there's, there's no, I mean, that's just things that are unique. And, and I think the argument that, <laughs> that like, uh, this has never ever happened before, so therefore it's divine is, 
is absurd. I don't understand that because it, you know, things that never happened before transpire all the time. I mean, the, yeah, there's never been anything like the Book of Mormon. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's an inspired, wonderful text. But that does not equate to ancient translation. Um, okay. Um, so, but you still find, you still find value in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wh what about Book of Abraham? Same, Same thing. thing. Okay. Same thing. And what do you think of the catalyst theory? So, and to explain what that is, and then explain yeah, what you think about and it. And I delve into that in the book. We'll talk about that next section. You know, it, it, it's just the idea that rather than um, producing a literal scriptural text that Abraham once wrote down on papyri, that it's a, that Joseph Smith tried to interpret that material and it proved in his in efforts of interpreting it was a catalyst then to receive an inspired scriptural text. Yeah, that's, that's very much the way I see it. You see it that way? Yeah. Okay, so with that and with the church's move to recently, we heard this first from Spencer Fluman and I read it in your book, by the way, mm. this idea that the Book of Mormon isn't a translation. The Book of Mormon is, uh, in Spencer Fluman's words, Joseph's greatest revelation, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not what we thought it was, uh, translating golden plates into English from Reformed Egyptian. It's basically just Joseph channeling his sense of the divine. Is that a bait and switch? Is that gaslighting? Like we all, prophets for over 150 years, led us down this path of sure. Joseph's a translator. He used the Urim and Thummim to translate golden plates from a foreign Egyptian to English. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, he didn't use the plates, he had a peepstone, and it really wasn't a translation, it was just something he channeled. Yeah. Is that a, some people say that's something unethical happened there, some sort of bait and switch. Can you see that? Oh, sure. I can, I can see that. Of course. I just had never interpreted it that way. I've seen the work, whether you're talking Spencer or the Gibbons or, you know, other people that I respect and admire it. Um, I've seen it as the same thing that I was doing and did throughout my life. And that is trying to make sense of critical scholarship in light of their spiritual convictions. So, but there's the accountability of what we were taught by church leaders and by prophets. Sure. How, what do you do with that accountability piece? Um, and, by, and by the way, by seminary teachers. <laughs> sure. Who taught us that um, translation stuff? I, uh, I I've never had any any resentment towards church leaders or you know things people that have taught things that. I've later learned to be incorrect. I have always felt like these are good men and women <laughs> who have wanted to do what is right and, and to the best of their limited abilities. And I still, yeah, I even see that with the policy. And that's one of the reasons I was able to keep my job for a while um, as a religious educator because I was able to say, I said, you know what, I, I know these aren't bad men that are just trying to hurt people. They're facing a very difficult situation with a changing world that is changing socially and scientifically, and they're trying to make sense of those changes in light of their strong doctrinal convictions and beliefs, and to do so with the best of their ability. And I, so I, I've never felt any resentment towards that or, or felt that that was nefarious or, or problematic myself. I, but I can see why others would think that way. And I, 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 for me, I would just, you know, put my arm around him, brother and sister, and say, "Let's help you find something else that's gonna, gonna bring satisfaction and direction to your life." But what about? And I'm not trying to force you or corner you. I'm just no. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I told you. I, you can ask me. So, anything. so like Joseph Fielding Smith ripping out an account of the first vision out of a Joseph Smith's journal, so that we won't yeah. discover a different version than what we're comfortable with, yeah. or. Um, you know, Michael Quinn being ex excommunicated for teaching stuff that now, or Fon Brody being excommunicated for things that now we acknowledge is totally true and sell sure. a Deseret book. There, there's the cover up. There's the, you know, people say there's a cover up. We were misled. We were, you know, people who tried to speak openly about truth were punished, mm -hmm. shamed, lives were wrecked. 
where's the accountability for those sorts of behaviors? And the fact that we know that from the 60s onward with Leonard Arrington, that the, the brother in the Quorum of the 15, Quorum of the 12, First Presidency, they've known about all these historical problems that we're now just learning about in the past 10 years. And they literally just shelved it and mothballed it, fired people, excommunicated people, closed it down, and taught this faithful history for decades to prolong you know, our, our, our consciousness as a society about these problems, some would say that's a cover-up, that's abuse, that's horrible stuff to do, especially when people build their lives around these truth claims, to know that leaders acted in that way, leading people to, to spend money and time and lives in ways that they wouldn't have if they had all the information. Some would say that's egregious, abusive, terrible. Yeah. I, I don't see it that way. Yeah, how do you see it? I see it as... Um, no, well, first of all, I, I totally am with you. A cover up. I mean, that's just documented, right? I mean, it's all I have to do is just read the, you know, when it, you know, read the sources and there's clearly a, a, an issue to cover up information that would, was deemed would be harmful to people. That's without question that it took place. And part of that with excommunications, which I have always opposed, um, at least for, you know, scholarship or, you know, activism and, and things like that. I have always been adamantly opposed to excommunication in any form. So do I believe that abuses have taken place? Absolutely. I mean, they clearly have. Um, emotional. I feel I have went through quite a bit of emotional abuse in my experiences that's trying to help people. So I, I'm not saying that that is incorrect in what you're saying. I, I agree with you. But I just don't believe that it was ever done with an intent to seriously harm, that it was done. And that doesn't justify it, everything. But I believe that it, it, it was always done with, out of their desire to help people um, experience happiness and joy. And I'm not saying that justifies it. Please don't misthink me. But I am saying that that does, I, I, I strongly believe that about these people from our community. And um, so, but it doesn't justify it, and it is wrong when that has taken place. And I am pleased to see the church evolve and 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 do better. And I hope that it will continue to do so. I just can't. I just won't be there to help it with that process any longer because I I can't do that. So somehow you've escaped being angry at, at church leaders, at, Br at Bruce Overconkey, at Joseph Fielding Smith, at Boyd K. Packer, at. Bednar at, you know, whoever nowadays is at Oaks and Nelson, you found a way to not be angry at them. It doesn't mean that, that, that I haven't gotten angry. I mean, at things that they've said or done, right? That doesn't mean that that's not the same thing. Um, you know, I just, you know, Elder, Elder Oaks' most recent conference talk um, is angry, because I know what that will do to LGBTQ, especially youth in the church, to hear that. And that may, of course I'm angry. I'm, it makes me furious. But no, I'm not angry at him. There's a, there's a, there's a difference. I, I believe he's trying to do what is right, and I absolutely disagree with him. And same with the church. The church is trying to do what's yeah. right and trying to help people. And I think it does, and I know it does. I, I, I know it helps a lot of people that I love live really wonderful lives, my mom, my dad, my oldest daughter. And if you fit that mold, it's a powerful tool that can and does help people. And I appreciate that. I'm very grateful for that. I love to hear my daughter's oldest daughter's testimony and of how the church has helped her in her life. And I am filled with gratitude for what the church has done in that sense. But it comes down to John, I just, and I'd say this, I don't expect perfection from my friends. I don't expect it from institutions. I don't expect it from anybody. I mean, I just, I, I try to see the good in people and I, I try to help along the way. How do you draw the line? Like, let's just say eugenics, somebody who believes mm -hmm. in a master race because they want the best for mankind. And so they want to filter out all the, all the inferior races or species in, in their minds. Sure. So their, their intention is to do good. Yeah. But they're committing genocide. Like, how do you, 
how do you sort of know where to draw the line for like giving someone the benefit of doubt regarding their intentions, but condemning what they're doing? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll offend your, some of your listeners again. I think Donald Trump is just one of the worst human beings has ever walked the face of the planet. Oh my gosh. I really do. But, uh, but, uh, I would define him as an American version of Adolf Hitler. Um, and I am, I have no problem saying these things, but that having been said, um, do I believe that he's intrinsically evil, that he's not, not trying to do things that are good? No, I, 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 I hate what he is doing, but I don't hate Donald Trump. And there's a difference. And do you I mean, think I, he's probably in his way trying to do his best? I don't know. I, I don't. I mean, I really don't. I, I think maybe sometimes, but I honestly don't think he believes in a, in a lot himself. I think other than, than power and authority. Um, but I, uh, I, I, it comes down to this. I, I just, I love people. I really love people. And I, I try to see the good and try to see what they're doing and as, you know, from that angle, no matter who they are. Even was, Trump, I, 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 that's what I say. I, I just, I would never say I hate him. I, I don't hate him in any stretch, but I, so it's kind of that way. Listeners, don't get mad that David criticized Trump. That's just David's no, they can get view. Mad. <laughs> <laughs> don't get mad at Mormon stories. <laughs> you were once kind of viewed as a champion of a thoughtful faith. I'm sure people thought of you as like the great hope to do what David Wright couldn't do, to do, to sort of bridge and, and integrate um, uh, higher criticism and the documentary hypothesis with, with belief. What's it like to kind of fall from grace in that regard? Um, I don't feel that I was ever, it's clear to me that the church, CES, BYU never wanted me to assume that role. I mean, that's just obvious to me. So I don't know that I ever, there certainly were some perhaps that felt that. And I, I'm still more than happy to help people, um, uh, make sense of their spiritual convictions, whether it's in Mormonism or another faith in light of historical scholarship. I teach academically now at Salt Lake Community College. And even in my world civil class, I'll teach things that I know are challenging for people of different faiths. And I always do my best to try and help them and comfort them and say, it's okay, here are ways that you can look at it and still maintain your religious community and your spiritual convictions. So um, I, I don't know that I've fallen from grace because I don't think I was ever put in that position or wanted to fulfill that position in any sense. But um, I, yeah, it, it's, I'm more than happy. I, my, my focus now is really on individuals, trying to help there. Have you disappointed any mentors that really supported you, that really you looked up to? They, their, their friendship and relationship with you was connected to your upholding the faith, and now you're not doing that. And, and, is, I still and has see that been me, hard? I still see me upholding the faith, though. I guess that's what I'm saying. I just, I'm just holding it up according to my convictions. But if, from their point of view, you're not. You're, yeah. You're, you're leaving the church. You're... You're talking openly yeah, about its problems. And I don't even see myself as having left the church. I would never describe It's so negative. No, that's good. So how do you see it? I, I see it as someone who, I mean, because the difference between, the opposite of love is not, is not hatred. The opposite of love is indifference, right? You're not, if, I mean, I don't really care what, I'm, I may care about, you know, Scientologists, but so far as what Scientology is doing, I don't have, and I don't really give it two thoughts. I'm kind of indifferent. But I can never be indifferent to, to Mormonism because I, I love it and it's I love my community. Um, so I, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there are people that are disappointed in me, probably, probably in the way that the life has gone. Probably more family disappointment than anything. But um, I hope that it's part of the reason why I want to share my share my story, and I'm grateful that you provide an opportunity to do that. I hope that even if people disagree, they'll at least have a better understanding of what I've gone through, what my family's gone through, and why we are where we are right now. Has, have any of your former mentors reached out to you and said, David, I'm so disappointed in you. You've gone down the wrong path. You're... No. No? Not one? No, because most of my, 
I don't know that I had really had a lot of mentors. And you said you're friends with Daniel Peterson. That's you know? true, but we don't. We're not. We don't really okay. converse anymore. Okay. I mean, we just or Jack Welch. He wrote the foreword to your book. Yeah, I'm sure he's not loving this. Yeah, I. But he hasn't reached out to you or no. Try to keep you in the faith or any of that. No. Okay. And I, I, I think I'm kind of. I don't know. Probably viewed as a, as a as a lost cause in the sense that, you know, I mean, written off you're saying, yeah, I mean, really, I, I people aren't going to be able to raise arguments historically or about scripture or things like that, that have made me go, Oh man, I, now I should be okay with the fact that the church is harmful to LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Again, um, as I was reading this book and we'll talk about it in our next segment, you make such an effort to quote B.H. Roberts and all these quotes about faith and knowledge being reconcilable and how you have B.H. Roberts saying true reverence is not a lack of questioning, but serious study, pondering, and inquiry. And, you know, as you're going off to David Wright and study at Brandeis, I'm never going to believe in the documentary hypothesis, you know. And but, but, but even so, so much of this book just three years ago, you're basically saying faith and scholarship are, are not... Um, are, are, are reconcilable. They're, they're not irreconcilable, whatever. Not anathema. What, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What's the word I'm trying yeah. to get out there? And yet you're now out. And it took you a long time. But there's this vision of saying, don't fear scholarship. Don't fear thinking. Don't fear academics. Because you can do both. You can be a scholar, academic, and a faithful person. Why isn't your life yet another testament that actually they're irreconcilable, that they're allergic to each other, that they're oil and water. That Because if it had not been for the November 2015 policy, um, I'd still be reconciling faith and scholarship and teaching and church and education. So if the church rolled that back next week, you'd be back in? No, no, I, I, I couldn't because it's not just, that was the catalyst for me to step back and say, okay, what am I doing? Where am I at? So for me, John, it like I read the CES letter or something like that. And I, and I don't, don't get me wrong. I don't like belittle it or, or anyone's faith journey or, or, or challenges and stuff like that. But I read that and I, I think, okay, yeah, yeah. There are other ways of looking at it, but and, and you could shift paradigms and things like that, that I did my entire life. Um, I would have no problem doing that till I was the day I died. Um, but going back to what it was, so for me, it wasn't scholarship. Faith and scholarship go hand in hand, and they certainly should within Mormonism. And I stand by everything I said and, and wrote in the book, every single word, and I offered it as a gift trying to help, help people to go through that process. For me, it wasn't scholarship. It was, they were social issues. And my commitment to social justice that's where it was so it's a little bit different it's kind of like you don't need the church to be true but you need it to be good is that have you heard that quote yeah and, and it it started to fail the good test for you in terms of it causing too much harm to certain groups of people yeah is that right yeah I'm not trying to put words in your mouth no but. i i mean that's 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 yeah what do you what do you think about neo apologetics? This new movement with Givens and Fluman and Mason and Bushman to sort of try and lead the church in in this new direction. No more ad hominem. No more quasi pseudo scholarship. No more attacks and gathering evidence to torpedo people, but just reframing everything, recontextualizing everything, and yet still holding to a core literalism. There were golden plates. You know, it was a it was an inspired translation. This is God's one true authority church, and without the authority, you know, we're not going to make it back. There's still that kernel of literalism. Yeah, I I I love what um, those individuals are doing. I think it's great because I think what they're I don't see it in the way that you have expressed it as as a you know an, an idea to cover up or something from their perspective. I I, I didn't say these, that. I didn't okay. say cover up. Sorry, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. Then. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't see it as a negative thing. I, 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 I mean, I know these people. All oh, they're my friends, and I'm telling you, these are very sincere, committed, wonderful humans who, who want to address scholarship, and then, and then make, and try to make help 
themselves and others make sense of their spiritual convictions in light of it. And I think that's a good thing. I think I, I would hope more people would do that in all of their faith traditions. I think the two challenges some have with neo-apologetics is number one, they're still bolstering the claims of authority, mm -hmm. which I think you and I would agree or, or you, you've said you don't believe in that authority. Mm -hmm. And then there's no, they're sort of allowing people to transition to uh, maintain loyalties without any accountability for people being misled and for people being hurt. And in a sense, they're keeping people in a church that you yourself have decided is too harmful to too many people. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, they're enabling the harm and the false beliefs. Um, I guess in some sense for some individuals, but for many others, it's just simply a way of trying to live a spiritual harmonious life in light of the best information that they have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm not one to, to criticize ex Mormons or, you know, progressive Mormons or Orthodox Mormons for wherever they're at. If, if, if something is harming them spiritually, then they need to make changes. But if it's bringing satisfaction and joy, then I completely support that and encourage them in their efforts. Well, you, you know, there's this Mormon studies community that a lot of our listeners don't know about, but it's just the MHA people. It's the, the people that go to the Bushman or Givens institutes at BYU. And mm -hmm. I don't know how that's described, but there, there seems to be a real currency and credibility if you maintain the believer status and if you don't speak out against the church publicly. And then if you do, you kind of lose cashier credibility with, with the Mormon studies crowd. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've experienced at all? Is that true? Has that been your experience or not? Oh, some individuals, certainly. But um, as a whole, I, I think the Mormon studies community are, are very accepting and of people wherever they're at. I mean, we, I mean, you think about Grant Hardy had recently gave a fair presentation where he, um, you know, talked about how, you know, it wasn't his belief that the book of Mormon was inspired fiction, but that, uh, it, that view should not be criticized and that it should be one that should be allowed for in the realm of orthodoxy and acceptance in the church. I mean, you're talking about men and women that are very good, very kind, loving human beings. And I, yeah, I haven't experienced that. I think there's an openness to accept and embrace people wherever they're at. How does it... I, you've already talked about excommunications. Have you heard that Bill Real is now being summoned to a disciplinary council? I did hear that, yes. What are your thoughts and feelings? I, I guess you've already said it. Yeah, I, I am absolutely 100% opposed to excommunication for those sorts of issues. To me, it's it's atrocious. Are you at all worried that you might be excommunicated by speaking out? No. No, I no, you're not worried. I'm you don't think worried. that'll happen, or if no, it happens... I I don't think it'll it, it'll happen. I, I I can't imagine that it would, but um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't I don't worry about those things. I just I I worry much more about am I living a life of integrity? Am I speaking out for what I believe to be true? Am I trying to make the world a better place? Am I helping promote social justice? And am I doing that? Then you know, do what is right. Let the consequences follow. I mean, that's how I, I live. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. A couple questions from our listeners, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and this is, a, this is a long one. Okay. Gaslighting is the LDS Church's number one method of dealing with mistakes it makes regarding its own history and teachings of previous prophets. For example, Brigham Young's teaching, teachings on the Adam-God theory, which has its origins in the Old Testament. The LDS Church has a, virtue, a very unhealthy relationship with this theological history because gaslighting is basically denial. We don't apologize because we pretend that mistakes never happened so that we can preserve the narrative that doctrine never changes. What do you think will be the tipping point where members can finally know the problematic church history and hold to their integrity? That's the first part of this question. And then he goes on to say, I ask because part of my journey was a journey of integrity. LDS Church gaslighting and apologetics sacrifices integrity on the altar of quote, a faith-affirming narrative, unquote, as if that is a good excuse. Whatever that tipping point may be, the church will continue to hemorrhage members from my generation until it is achieved. That's a big old... Yeah. Any, any response to that? Sure, or? I and I, I agree. I certainly have seen that happen in the context of um, you know, uh, church leadership, in the context of apologetics, and I 
find it deeply offensive um, when it transpires. I mean, I've spoken out about it many times publicly and, and will continue to do so. Um, what will be the tipping point? Um, I don't know. Honestly, my sense is, is that, and maybe it's just because it's my experience, but, but I, I think social issues are much more serious uh, contemporary social issues are much more serious for the church and in struggling membership and losing people than historical inquiries or you know issues with scripture or those things um i, I especially working with the youth i mean it just yeah, they don't care about Bruce McConkey. Yeah, what Joseph Billy Smith Yeah, said. I mean, they it's, don't care. it's really, it's really. I see it. I mean, it's just, it's, not, it's not just a reflection of my own experience that I see it in others. I think that's, that's really where we stand to create a tipping point where people are going to start to really struggle to maintain membership. And I hope that's not the case. I hope the church can adapt and and progress and change. What is your reaction? Accommodate. Right. What is your reaction to the gospel topic essays that the church came out with? Love them, hate them, like them. Oh, it's it, with anything mixed. Yeah, with mixed. I think a lot of there. It's they're a wonderful step forward, without question. Uh, things that I, you know, have issues with uh, or concerns with um, that I probably, if I had, was in a position of authority, that I would do it right differently. But I, it's definitely a great step forward because I think the more that we can be open and honest with the evidence that it has and then let, and then allow for people to kind of, you know, shift their paradigms and come up with their own way of making sense of it or leaving it behind. If it makes them more happy, the better off that we'll be. Uh, who are your heroes in life? Um, Martin Luther King, um, Gandhi, um, Um, Jesus. I mean, yeah. Any women? Um, sure. Um, I, man, I don't know. I don't, I don't know these men or women a whole lot. Um, you don't but, like the idea of a hero? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's that I don't believe anybody's perfect. So I don't want to put anybody up on a pedestal where I expect that type of, where I idolize or put that sort of thing. I, I want to appreciate the good that they do and focus on that and try to learn from that, men or women or whatever it might be. So hero is just such a strong term. I guess my dad, my mom. What uh, what has barbecuing been about for oh, you? Oh, there we go. We knew this was going to come <laughs> up, right? <laughs> so this is so great. I I'm, 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 thanks whoever asked that. I just no, that was you. me. Oh, that was you. That okay, was me. Yeah. so um, that's just one but of my Rick, passions. Rick Rick also. Oh, did Rick do it? it? I know exactly which Rick you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Okay, so I uh, I am really passionate about barbecue. We didn't talk about that. I. Um, when I become passionate about something, it's 110% that I devote. And I, about 20 years ago, became passionate about barbecue. And I'd always loved it, but I, then I just studied it scientifically and artistically and started creating my own rubs and sauces and doing competitions and things like that. I, uh, um, what, the reason why I love it is because it brings community together. It brings family together. It brings people together to enjoy a good time and, and to you know, to, to be one. And that's, that's really what I love about barbecue. And that's, yeah, fundamentally it. And I think, I think Rick wanted to ask something about it. Tell him rub. I don't give any recipes. Do out. you, do you marinate your pork or just <laughs> use your rub? What's the secret to your sauce? That's uh, what Rick wants to know. That's great. Yeah, no. <laughs> you don't, you don't tell. Well, I mean, I do, I do, but no, I mean, I, I, I make my own sauce. I, I use a dry rub. I don't, I don't marinate um, typically stuff. So I do brine my turkeys though. So Thanksgiving what, coming up. What's been the role of music in your life? Huge um, role. I uh, um, still am a singer songwriter. I don't pretend to be good at it, but I. And we'll, we'll we'll use your songs for the bumpers. Oh, cool! Awesome. Uh, on these awesome. episodes, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So I, I started writing music when I was just a little kid 
and have continued to do so. I, it's a way of expressing my emotions and feelings. I think one of the ones you're going to use is a song that I wrote called Wild Heart. And, Tell us about it. And this song, um, the lyrics are, don't know why I can't feel the morning, don't know why I can't feel the dawn. Everything inside of me is lonesome, but I don't feel nothing at all. So it's this idea of really what I felt like I was going through is that, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of distancing myself now from this, 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 this church in a sense that has meant everything to me in my life. And I should be so sad and devastated, but I don't feel it. I don't feel that way. I don't feel that distance and that, that, that loss. Um, and then another line from it is, I uh, don't know why I can't say I love you. Don't know why you want me gone. And it's kind of in this Johnny Cash sort of sound and feel, and which is a genre that I love. And it's, um, you know, that's it. I just, you know, I, just, I, I, it was never a fall from grace going back from that. The reality is I really didn't feel wanted. Um, and I hear, I felt like I really wanted to offer training and skills and stuff to help, but it was something that, that just was rejected it, what, what I wanted to do. And, and, you know, I wish I could say, I just completely love you and, and embrace you. And I do, but it's not with the same type of love that you expect. I've got a wild, wild heart, which is a heart that is in, you know, I'm trying to express this idea of wildly, no matter what the consequences to pursue what is true and passionate and right. And that is certainly viewed by my faith community as, as a wild approach, but it's one that it defines me. So, so you still play guitar? Yeah. And yeah. We have a band called dead cowboys and we play locally here in Utah and playing in, um, park city in a couple of weeks. And, uh, it's a, it's a lot of fun. I, it, I, I really enjoy it. I, right now my kind of, I tell people my, my goal in life is to become a, a bar band that like gets regular <laughs> gigs scheduled. And we're almost there. We're on the cusp of a major success from my, per, my point of view. Have you seen the blues brothers? What is it? The blues brothers, the movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where the chicken wire and they're throwing the beer. Bottles yeah. Oh, yeah, at the yeah. Chicken wire. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's your that's aspiration. My, there, that's it. Right. <laughs> okay. No more BYU, no more scholarship. I just want that, that right there. We're almost there. And it's a good thing. <laughs> so, all right. So to close, uh, you know, the reason why Mormon stories still exist 13 years after it started, the reason why people still come back listening, we've now got, I don't know, 6 million downloads and views a year. It's crazy how much we've grown. People keep coming back because it's so hard to leave. It's just so hard to leave Mormonism. You think you're crazy. You think you're alone. You think you're broken. You can't. You, you think you, you can't be happy without it. Mm -hmm. You think you can't be healthy without it. You think you can't raise healthy, happy kids without it. So everybody's just freaking out, scared, insecure, struggling with just that transition. So you're in the middle of it. If you were to give some parting perspective to people going through it, based on what you've experienced, what wisdom would you want to leave people with um, in, in terms of how to navigate what they're going through? Yeah. Um, the same advice I gave to my son, and that is um, to embrace a religion of love, to embrace a religion of service, to embrace a religion of, um, <clears throat> of developing the mind, uh, to embrace that process and to find ways to supplement that. I mean, for me, it's been now moving into in prison education. Uh, for my son, it's been local community service and going off on these humanitarian trips, um, there, this, we have to, we're spiritual beings. We just are. We have to find ways to supplement that, uh, that loss and to fill it. And I've just been so proud of my children as they've gone through this and what a wonderful job that they've, they've done. I've been impressed with them. My son is the um, honors national honor society president in Borum high school. Um, he, uh, involved with things. My youngest daughter as well, just straight A's and AP and she's, and she's just flourishing in this. And that doesn't mean I'm not trivializing how hard it is. It's, it's a challenge when you go through something like that as an individual, as a family, but, um, embrace love and, and to be, I, and I would encourage people as well. I would say, be forgiving, be forgiving, um, to realize that, you know, yeah, there have been church leaders that have done and continue to do some really awful things. Um, but 
forgiveness is just the only way forward. We have to learn to do that. And then do what with your life when you're not going to church every Sunday, when you're not... Spend time with your family. That's what we've been doing. I've had a lot more Sundays now with Sunday brunch and things like that with my wife that we've enjoyed getting together. We go to... Um, we're really into live music, so my wife and I go hear live music every weekend now and enjoy that. The local bands that are playing fill it with rich, wonderful activities such as that. And, um, you know, and I've appreciated watching you provide those sorts of opportunities socially and communal experiences for, for post-Mormon groups. And I think that's, I think it's wonderful, John. Hmm, thank thanks. you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. So would you say you're... Happier now than you were before? Healthier now? Less healthy? Less happy? Um, Somewhere in the middle? Same? I'd say I am happier now, certainly than I was over the past couple of years, trying to navigate and figure out what I was going to do. Definitely happier now. Um, uh, I don't know. What was the rest of it? it healthier? Healthier? Healthier. Oh, I'm marriage. absolutely healthier. You're a better dad, worse dad. Better. Oh yeah. I was, I was really heavy. I did. I had, um, I was using barbecue and food as my drug of choice. And with that combined with scholarship, I was up to like 250 pounds and with high blood pressure. And I just, it was completely out of control. And now I just, now I, I go to the gym probably five, six days a week. And I, yeah, so it's it's finding other things. You're that physically are healthy. healthier. Physically healthier, absolutely, okay. and definitely emotionally because, and I am grateful for critical scholarship, which helped me be more open towards social issues that are concern in my life right now. Yeah. So, and your marriage, better Excellent. or worse? Yeah, uh, really strong, stronger than it's ever been. I've been very fortunate that way, and that we both grown together and changed together. And that's not always the case. And I recognize that. So my heart goes out to those who are not in that situation. I've been very fortunate and my wife has been very loving and supportive. And we, uh, yeah, I mean, in ways we're closer now than we've ever been. We get to go out and, you know, go hear live music. And like I said, do a Sunday brunch. It's, it's wonderful. And you feel you're a better dad than you would have been? Absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. I imagine that's partly because you can let your kids be who they want instead of who you want them to be. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, one, one listener writes, uh, maybe this is, I don't know if you want to end it this way, but Emily writes, be where you missed the boat. What they feared from David, ironically, would have given them legitimacy leverage, she wrote. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of us feel like, be where you missed the boat. Do you wish you were there now? No, no, absolutely. You really don't? Really, 100%. You gave your whole life to that, and now you don't... I know. You feel I like mean, you dodged a bullet? Oh, I, I mean, going back to that story, John, that I, I shared with Ron Walker, um, where he predicted, he said, he said, the day will come when you will realize what a good thing that this is, it's, it, and that you will, if you had gone that route, you would not have been able to do the things that you need to do, scholarly and sh speaking and, and, and other venues as well. And he was exactly right. I mean, I, I cannot imagine what it would be like to be in a BYU position right now as in given what I feel about church leadership, given what I feel about the scripture and particularly given what I feel about the LGBTQ community and the way that we are harming them and the way that that needs to stop. I just, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't survive in that, in that environment any longer. So um, yeah, no hard feelings. It's, it was very difficult to go through at the time, but yeah, we're, I'm in a good place now. All right. We're literally like a few seconds left. So okay. next part, we're going to talk about authoring the Old Testament. We'll come back on live. Please join us for the next part. We're going to take apart all the different Mormon scriptures using uh, higher criticism. David Bakavoy, you're brilliant. Oh, thank we you. love you. Thank you for the honor of Mormon Stories Podcast coming on. Thanks to all the listeners who joined us. And don't go away. Come right back for the next part after we have lunch or later. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Thank Thanks, you, David. Yeah.